Hidden throughout Walt Disney World is a network of sensors, and those sensors have one job, to track you. Because while we think of Disney as an entertainment company, Disney is actually also a massive technology company. And for the last decade, they've been using cutting edge technology to track and aggregate millions of guest movements and actions. Meaning yes, when you're visiting their parks, they are tracking you, what you do, how you do it, and when you do it. So today we are diving into the history and current status of Disney's proprietary guest tracking system. Last week, my sister did a Mouse Lips Monday on a civil engineering feat at Walt Disney World about how they're able to keep mosquitoes out. So today, I figured that I would do something related to my full-time job, which is being a director of product management at a global media company, aka working in tech. So today, I'm putting on my tech hat to talk to you about the way that Disney tracks you, or to put it in more technical terms, the way that Disney aggregates millions of guest actions into their giant Internet of Things data processor. Don't worry, we'll break all that down in a minute. But first, let's talk about the concept of Disney even using data at all. When we think of data, we probably think of numbers and charts and Excel, and we'll get to all that. But far before computers even existed, Disney was using user data to inform park designs. During the early days of Disneyland, Walt waited to pave certain paths, instead preferring to see where the guests naturally walked and observe what paths were naturally created before making the final decision. And so he was using this data that he observed to figure out where the paths should go. And this showcases that data has always been critical to Disney's success. Because even for something as simple as understanding how many tickets they can sell for a certain day or how much those tickets should cost, Disney needs data to be able to operate their parks efficiently and effectively. But the way that Disney has captured data has changed over the years, and so let's rewind to the year 2008. In the year 2008, not much was happening at Walt Disney World, while the year prior, Universal Studios had announced that they would be opening the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. You can truly be part of Harry Potter's world, where magic becomes real and excitement awaits at every turn. Ready. Explore the wizarding world of Harry Potter, a world of magical new adventures only at Universal Orlando Resort, where you can be courageous, be outrageous, be extraordinary. We've talked about this in other Mouseless Mondays, but this was a huge shakeup in the theme park space and meant that Disney really needed to step up their game if they wanted to continue to compete with Universal. But at that time, Disney was a bit stagnant. Magic Kingdom, Epcot, and Animal Kingdom hadn't really seen any major changes since Expedition Everest had opened at Animal Kingdom in 2006. And while 2008 brought the rebrand of MGM Studios to Hollywood Studios, as well as the opening of Toy Story Mania, that was kind of all that was going on there at the time. And from a guest experience perspective, things were complicated and still ran largely the way they had throughout the 80s and 90s. Meaning that fast passes were still paper, and while many of us may miss that system today, when you think about it, it did mean that guests had to be physically running around the park and keeping track of small pieces of paper not the most efficient system. Dining reservations were still made by phone, meaning that guests had to write down their own confirmation numbers and then bring them in order to have any record of their reservation. They had to keep track of paper tickets for each guest in their party, as well as totally separate room keys. And all of this was compiled with long guest wait times, limited visibility into shorter alternatives, and overall low guest satisfaction scores. At the time, around half of first-time attendees left the park saying that they would not be likely to return. And then, also in 2008, the Great Recession hit. And recessions typically hit the travel industry hard, meaning weak demand and lower attendance. So Disney knew that it was time. They needed to fix these problems in order to improve guest satisfaction and be able to maximize spending from the existing guests even as attendance may lower due to the recession. So they began to ask themselves this question, what if you could walk through the park and everything just worked? Rather than standing in line to manually enter the park through a turnstile, you could just enter. No more hotel check-in, you could walk to your room and magically open your door. Wait times would be low, and if they were high, you could easily find an alternative. And everything from ride reservations to character greetings to food orders would be personalized for you. They went through the exercise of identifying barriers and friction at basically every turn in a Disney guest journey, but they needed to figure out how to actually solve these problems. And one day, inspiration struck for a Disney executive who was flying and reading a Sky Mall magazine. He saw a product promotion for a wearable golf wristlet that was able to track your swing and supposedly reduce muscle soreness at the same time. And he had the idea to create something similar for Disney a virtual key to the kingdom that would digitally carry everything a guest would need for their park experience, from park tickets to room keys to photo pass cards to even money. And in these early phases of ideation, they considered making a band like the golf one that they'd seen, but they also considered a lanyard, 
a Mickey Mouse hat, and even a magic wand. This is a particularly cool piece to the story because it involves some Mouselet's lore. When my sister, Mouselet 2, was in high school, a former student came back to talk to her AP Econ class about her time as an intern at Walt Disney Imagineering. And she told them about the project that she worked on as the very first iteration of Magic Bands. But instead of a magic band, it was a magic wand. The idea was that guests could carry around their own magic wand to do things like scan into fast passes or scan into the park, but also to bring the park to life in their own ways with many of the fun capabilities that we see today with Magic Band Plus, like making statues interact. In fact, it was fairly similar to what Universal ended up doing years later with their own wands in the Harry Potter worlds. All right, Immobilis. But ultimately, as we know, the magic wand did not come to fruition at Disney, and instead it became what we now know as the magic band. And so magic bands became the cornerstone for this new technology initiative, meaning that of course magic bands are technology enabled, specifically with a technology called RFID. Inside of each magic band is an RFID tag, and this tag emits radio waves. Those radio waves can then be read by various sensors, such as this one seen here from a Disney patent filing. When it comes to magic bands at Disney, there are two different types of sensors, and the first is a short range sensor. This is a sensor that is active, meaning it requires someone to actually do something in order to activate it, such as touching your magic band to a turnstile. The second type is a long range sensor. This is a passive sensor, meaning that whether or not you know it, the sensor is picking up your movements even if you're not doing anything to trigger it. At Disney, we're very familiar with short range sensors. These are the things that we take action with at Disney, such as the turnstile when we enter the park, the lock on the door of our Disney resort room, scanning in to use a fast pass or nowadays a lightning lane, paying for an item with our magic band, or any time we tap a cast member device, such as at PhotoPass or at Guest Experience. These sensors even exist in places that we wouldn't necessarily think of, like on the refill mugs at Disney, there's a sensor there that tells if you're able to refill or not. And all of those are using short range active RFID sensors. But there's also long range RFID sensors. The use case that we're all the most familiar with would be when ride photos appear in your My Disney Experience app, despite the fact that you didn't actually scan them, such as on rides like Dinosaur or Tron. Those use long range RFID to identify when you were on the ride and when your photo was taken and then send it into your app. But long range sensors were also added as part of the Magic Band program throughout the parks, meaning that as you walk around, there are sensors everywhere that identify where exactly you are at any given moment. It's not GPS location technology because it all depends on the sensor in your Magic Band connecting to the sensors that Disney has set up. So it's not like if you went home, Disney would be able to tell where you were. But when you're in the parks, the RFID sensor in your magic band is constantly transmitting radio waves to the sensors that Disney has set up everywhere. And therefore, they're able to figure out where you are, where you've been, and where you're going. And if that sounds a little creepy, it kind of is, but it also kind of isn't. And we'll get into that more in a moment. But for now, back to the Magic Band Development Program. At this point, it's around 2010, 2011, and Disney has their Magic Band prototypes created. But Magic Bands alone aren't enough. They need some sort of system that will actually aggregate all of this data and help them use it to make decisions. And so they created a system called XConnect. XConnect aggregated all of the active and passive actions that we just talked about into a giant internet of things. AKA XConnect was a giant data processor that was able to take all of those things and put them into one single streamlined dashboard. And it's really this dashboard where the magic happened for Disney because they were able to take millions of data points across thousands of guests and pool them together into one place. So in 2013, when they launched this system, which included Magic Bands, My Magic Plus, and FastPass Plus for guests, as well as the internal XConnect system, they could see everything, like how many guests were entering the park and how many guests were in line for each ride which also meant that they knew if lines were getting too long, and then they could take actions like deploy additional fast passes to various rides as needed. They also could see heat maps that showed where crowds were forming and then deploy entertainment or drop wait times elsewhere in order to disperse traffic. They even created a brand new food delivery system at the Be Our Guest restaurant, where sensors were able to identify exactly where guests were sitting, allowing their food to be magically delivered to them. And so from an operational perspective, the program was a huge success. Disney released statistics saying things like wait times at the turnstiles dropped by 30% 
and park capacity was able to increase by 5,000 guests per day for the same exact experiences. And according to Disney, guest satisfaction increased and they were able to reverse the trends that they were seeing in 2008. I am having so much fun, partly because Disney has made it even easier to make plans and arrange your most important details so you can simply enjoy your time together during your visit. I made all my reservations at home, even selected my Fast Pass Plus experiences before I even packed. But there were aspects of the system that didn't work as well as Disney had planned. Disney dreamed of cast members and characters personally greeting each guest by name, which would be shown to them thanks to the RFID technology, but that never came to fruition. Other features like incorporating guest names into attractions like the Small World End Scene or the Expedition Everest Queue were later removed, potentially due to guest privacy concerns. And despite what they dreamed of during planning, when they talked about things like sending you a coupon for an ice cream if they saw that you waited in line too long, Disney never really fully nailed down the idea of a fully personalized guest experience. And that brings us to today, because obviously technology has greatly advanced in the last 10 to 15 years. And Magic Bands aren't even as popular or ubiquitous as they once were in the Disney parks. Disney no longer gives them out to resort guests for free, probably because they didn't need to thanks to the advent of smartphones. Because while RFID tracking technology is still certainly used, it's no longer the only tool that Disney has at their disposal. Smartphones allow them to see guest locations in other ways, and they're even able to look at things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity. The heavy use of the My Disney experience Experience app means that Disney can see when and how and why guests are accessing it. And all of this is feeding into their giant Internet of Things database that is still used to this day. And so Disney certainly is to this day tracking you, but to be honest, they care less about you than they do about just getting your data. Because again, Disney really hasn't reached the point of having a fully personalized experience for every individual guest. Instead, they're using your data and putting it in with everyone else's data so that they can look at overall trends and operate their parks as efficiently as possible. Their goal with tracking is mainly to improve overall guest experiences rather than figure out what you as an individual are doing. And the moments where Disney does care about you personally are primarily for things like safety rather than personalization. For example, if you ever go to Disney World on a rainy day, you'll notice that you can't walk through the turnstile with your umbrella up. This is because Disney has cameras that are doing facial recognition when you enter the park and having an umbrella up would block those cameras. There are people online who will say that this isn't true, but it is. And no, it's not CIA level facial recognition or anything of the sort, but it is enough to allow Disney to have a record of people entering and exiting their park at any time in case they need it for legal or safety reasons. The same goes for your fingerprint. When you enter the park, the fingerprint scanner that you're using is not a police grade fingerprint scanner. There's actually about a one in a thousand chance that someone else's fingerprint would work with your ticket. But they're enough to prevent ticket fraud and that's Disney's main intention. So yes, Disney is tracking you. And as AI advances, tracking technology will as well and rest assured, Disney will continue to use it. But for those concerned about privacy, know that Disney is using everything at an aggregate level. They're really not worried about what you are doing as an individual. And this has actually been something that Disney has struggled with for years. How to balance a personalized experience without being creepy. Back in the day, they toyed with the idea of showing your face in movie posters around Hollywood studios. And while that may be fun the first or second time that you see it, it might also get old and it might also feel a little bit too invasive. So they never implemented it. And Disney has had many ideas in the same vein. But for the most part, they've shied away from making experiences feel overly personalized because they know that it could cause adverse guest reactions. So that is a summary of where tracking at Disney is today. If you like learning about little pieces of Disney lore like this, or you're interested in Disney history, Disney facts, and Disney secrets, we have lots more Mouse That's Monday videos available on our channel. But for now, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.